Please be seated. Good morning, Kirby Woods. Thank you for being here today. Uh, last week, we began a new series called The Hundred Year War, highlighting the importance of family and a 100 year legacy that honors Christ. The purpose of this series is twofold it's first a guide for how to fortify yourselves against the enemy, how to strengthen our homes as we live as exiles in this world. And secondly, I see it as a guide as how to actually uh, nurse our weak and sick culture back to health, perhaps, if God would be gracious enough to see fit to revive our nation. Uh, if there were significant changes to one institution that he deeply cares about that could affect other things, I think that it would be the family. Many of our troubles arise from family breakdown. Perhaps the, the healing source of this nation would be to begin where the deepest problems are found. This question fundamentally in this series is what could be accomplished if we engaged in a 100-year war of faithfulness to God in our homes and all of our great-grandchildren knew and served Jesus in 21-23? Last week I asked you the question, will you enlist? My hope is that because you're here today, you said yes. Uh, you could just be a creature of habit, but I hope that you said yes. We looked at a long-term generational approach to life and legacy last week, starting uh, the beginning of more specific topics today, more practical messages that get into the nitty-gritty of that. One of the great challenges in beginning any new multifaceted endeavor is knowing where to start. It's kind of easy to see the end picture of what you want to accomplish for example, let's say you went out like a lot of other people and saw Top Gun Maverick this last year, and uh, it moved you so deeply that you thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be Tom Cruise. I want to be in the Air Force. I want to do barrel rolls and shoot missiles and uh, pull G-forces that make my face almost fall off. That's what I want to do more than anything. But let's say you wanted to do that. Where, where would you, what would you do the next day? What would you do to start that process? What's your first, second, third practical step to make that vision happen? Well, in a similar way, that's what I gave you last week, was the big picture. The future vision of your family tree serving Christ in 21-23. We talked about being an oak of righteousness last week that stands strong and tall as the world may crumble around it. The, the tree stands, but... How does a mighty oak come to be? You don't just clap your hands and uh, have a hundred foot tall oak tree. In fact, if you want a fun experiment, go find an acorn and just clap at it and say, oak tree, and see what happens. Nothing's gonna happen, I promise you. See, we, we love the idea of a culture where Christianity is flourishing, where churches are healthy, where one generation commends the works of God to another, like we said in Psalm 145 last week, However, those things are the fruit of the righteous tree. They are not the root. A cough and a runny nose are, are the symptoms, the fruits of a virus in you, but you don't address the problem with Kleenexes and cough drops. The fruits of our world are evident, and I mentioned them in the trailer for this series, the divorce, gender confusion, depression, anxiety, anger due to fatherlessness, falling birth rates, feelings of meaninglessness. These are all fruits to be addressed. But what I would like to do today is to submit to you that the root of the generational family tree, the root of Christian legacy that will produce fruit between now and 2123 is the union from which the entire tree is created, and that is marriage. The root of any tree Spanning generations is covenant marriage. Everything else flows from and will be deeply affected by the strength of this union between a godly man and woman. And I want you to see today marriage as not just one of many important aspects of a healthy family for generations, but as the primary root from which all future fruit will grow. So before we look at God's word, I'd invite you to pray with me. Lord, we invite your divine help to open up these scripture passages today. 
and make them apply directly to our hearts where we need them most. God, I confess in my voice I have no powers. I can't make anything happen by just declaring it. If you don't move, Lord, uh, nothing will happen. So, Father, we're just praying uh, that you would use me as a vessel today and that this would be your time, that, God, where rebukes are necessary, we would hear them, uh, and where encouragements are needed, we would receive those as well. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'd invite you to turn. First passage I'm going to be in is Genesis 24. We've got a few minutes before I'll get there, but go ahead and pre-turn to Genesis 24, 1. This is a more topical series than I'm used to doing. I told you that, so don't be alarmed when we're jumping around the different passages. That's on purpose. Um, This sermon today is going to be most relevant to those who are seeking to be married or are already married. So I want to confess that to you up front. Um, But for our unmarried brothers and sisters, I would ask you not to tune out. Uh, Don't think this isn't for me. First of all, you don't know whether or not you will be married one day. You don't know. You may think you know, but you don't know. And secondly, um, even if you don't marry for your entire life, you are absolutely entitled and I would hope encouraged to speak God's truth into other people's lives. So just because you haven't experienced something directly doesn't mean you can't speak to it. I don't need to bring in a guest speaker who's committed murder when I preach on the Ten Commandments, right? With God's word, I can address it. So can you. You don't have to have experienced everything in order to speak truth to it. So... Our culture needs you to know these truths. So as we build this outline today, I I want to frame it in the following way. Three ways that we must see marriage for long-lasting generational impact if you want the 21-23 vision. You have to see marriage three ways, I believe. So this is the first one. Number one, a consequential choice. You have to see it as a consequential choice. Now, I want to say that this first point applies to everyone. I'm even ratcheting down my audience even further for this first point, okay? I am targeting right now those who have never been married and desire one day to be married, okay? That's who I'm talking to right now for this first point. If you have never been married but hope to one day be married, you know, if you're comfortable raising your hand and saying, that's me, you know, let me just see you. I'd like to see you. You've never been married, and you hope one day to be married. Some of y'all are lying over here. None of y'all want to be married? Come on. Get in the game, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Okay. It's a sad day in this section over here. Um, so I think they just don't, uh, don't like me. They don't want to interact with me. I'll be sad later. It's fine. Um, so I want to talk to you guys today. The, the, the passion you're about to feel rolling off of me is because I love you. It's because I care deeply about your future. And that's, that's what I want to focus in on today, especially on this day when we're going to honor you as graduates in a moment. The most important decision you can make in your entire life is whether or not you will bow the knee to Jesus Christ and follow him and serve him. Amen? That's number one. Number two is who you marry. It is that serious. It is not casual. It is not whatever. The entire trajectory of your life and your family tree will be wrapped up in who you marry and join yourself to. We put our kids through all kinds of preparation for skills that they may never use. I lifted heavy weights for four years in high school to play football every day after school. I know by looking at me today, you dispute that claim. But there was a time back in my prime, I promise you. Um, I lifted and pressed and squatted and ran through tires and caught passes every single day for four years after high school. Our practices went from about two in the afternoon to about six at night. This was in a heavy, a highly competitive uh, county in Florida, which is like Texas. You know, it's, it's very serious football. And let me just tell you, for all that preparation, not since 18 years old, have I played an organized game of football or strapped on pads? Not one day. I learned a lot of algebra and geometry. I memorized the periodic table of elements and I prepared for my ACT and SAT and took honors and AP classes. Worked like a dog between football and and all that homework to get that done before bedtime at a reasonable hour so that I could go to a good college. And guess what, I did. And I'm not unique. 
That's how it is for most of our kids these days. And again, we're recognizing you graduates at the end of this service, but let me tell you something. None of those things that I prepped hours for have near the practical impact on my life like my marriage does. And how much preparation are we giving our young people for that? We treat education and sports like an intense boot camp, like their very lives depend on it. But when it comes to who they're dating and what principles they apply to their relationships, like we just start saying things like, well, some lessons you just have to learn the hard way or they'll figure it out. No, you didn't say that when it was time to prep for the ACT, did you? We need to communicate that these decisions, like who you're dating, are life and death because they are. They are. Parents, you need to be active in your sons and daughters' lives, particularly in how they view relationships and dating. Tell them. Train them. Talk about it as much or more as you talk about getting into college. It's more important than their education. Adults, amen? It is. Listen to people who've done it. Listen. Look with me now, Genesis 24. I want to see this passage. Um, This is how serious Abraham viewed marriage for his son, Isaac. Abraham is old in this part of the story. Actually, Abraham's old in every part of the Bible. Um, Isaac is at the age where he's about to take a wife, and Abraham is looking for that wife for him. And so he's probably not able age-wise to go and do this, this conquest, this travel Um, And yes, and by the way, in these days, marriages were more arranged than they are today. So I just want you to know that. But still, this is true. Nothing changes in this story. So listen to the passion in Abraham's voice. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in years. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son, Isaac. Now, we know from the Bible this woman would be Rebecca. It's a beautiful story how this works out. She comes out and serves them, waters the camels and does all that. You can read that story. It is definitely worth it. But what Abraham goes to his top servant that he's going to send out on this mission, this quest, and he makes him pledge, swear to me, swear to me that you will not take a Canaanite wife for my son. Do not let him marry a Canaanite woman. What's this about? Simply put, Canaanites worshipped Baal and Asherah. They sacrificed their kids to Molech. They were pagans who had sex in temples for worship. Abraham is old by the time he grows up, so... He he takes his servant and says, listen, swear to me that you will not let this happen. This is a deep concern for Abraham. And why would it be a deep concern? Because it would be over before it started. God's plan to call out a people to a great land, a great name, a great nation, to bless the earth through Abraham's seed would be over. Isaac was the son of promise to Sarah. To join to a Canaanite would guarantee Isaac's heart would be at best conflicted and turned to worship other gods. It would guarantee that their children would not know or worship Yahweh in the same way Abraham knew and worshiped Yahweh. The godly legacy would be left to a roll of the dice, and Abraham was willing to fight for it. I'm about to say something now that'll offend, because... I've seen this in every church I've ever been to. To the Christian youth, college, young adults, if you date and marry an unbeliever, you have no idea the pain and the hardship you just entered into. Stop making excuses. God has spoken on this. You are not to date or marry one who does not know Christ as Savior. Parents, we need to stop being afraid of our kids and speak up. You need to summon whatever power Abraham had in this moment. Do not take a wife from the Canaanites. 
Marry from our people, from those who love Jesus, from those who will agree with you on the purpose of life, from those who will share your priorities, who will worship alongside you in church, who will pray with you and for you, who will teach your children the truth when they are alone with them in the room and in the car, and when they see something on TV that's confusing and they ask about it, that you trust implicitly what they're going to say to them. Do not be unequally yoked. You need a helper, a partner, a fellow soldier in the trenches with you for the sake of the gospel. Someone who can love you because they know the love of Christ. Someone who can forgive you because they know what it is to be forgiven by Christ. And someone who can sanctify you because they themselves are filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray your parents tell you that. I pray they tell you that. But if they don't, this is my job. Do not take an unbelieving wife from the Canaanites. The choice is the most consequential you will make outside of your salvation. Nothing else we do today is going to make any sense if you don't start there. That's how we make a generational impact for Christ. Number one, we must see marriage as an extremely consequential choice. Secondly, we must see marriage as, number two, a consecrated covenant. A consecrated covenant. We're all still here. I'd like to begin this section by looking at the original marriage in Genesis 1.23. If you, excuse me, 126. If you'd like to go ahead and turn there. Um, when we say covenant, we just mean an agreement between two parties. That's what a covenant is. But let me tell you something that I say in, in premarital counseling that something that makes a marriage covenant different from a business contract. Maybe you've wondered what this is. If you, if you contract somebody to do business at your house, let's say they're going to install some new floors at your house, and both parties unanimously say, you know what, neither one of us really want this work to be done anymore. We haven't paid you yet. We don't want the work. And he says, well, turns out I don't want to do the work. Well, what you can do is, is tear the contract up, shake hands, and go your separate ways, and it's all good. That's a contract. When we look at marriage, both parties enter into an agreement. Let's say one day you're sipping your coffee at breakfast time and you unanimously, right at the same time, in unison, look up at each other and you say, I don't want to be married to you anymore. And you shake hands and you say, I don't want to be married to you anymore. And you head down to the courthouse and you call it quits and that's it. Everybody's in agreement. Both are, are good. Both are smiling. Is it the same? No, it's not. The reason that you can do that to your business contract is because it's between two parties. And if two parties want out, two can get out. Problem is with a covenant marriage is there's not two parties. There's three parties. Husband, wife, God. If you don't have permission from all three parties to dissolve, you don't have permission. This is a covenant. It is intense. It is heavier than any decision you make you enter into, or you can break. It is a holy union by its very definition. It is consecrated. A wedding ceremony ought to be serious stuff. So let's look at the first union. God made man and woman. It was assumed that they were married. They were the only two people on the face of the earth. And I want to show you briefly what marriage does, what it is, and what it pictures. Little three sub points for you. What it does, what it is, and what it pictures. First, we see this. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here we have the creation of man and woman. God tells us the first thing that separates man and woman from all other parts of creation is that they are made in the image of God. Man is not God, but man does contain something that animals and plants and rocks don't have, and that is that we have a certain likeness to God intended to represent and communicate with God. We have moral reasoning. Uh, dogs and cats can't be moral or immoral, and ultimately, we bear an eternal soul. 
We have an eternal soul that will last forever. Animals, plants do not. So God says that man and woman have dominion over created things, that we are uh, to subdue creation together. We are to rule together. And he says, then, the main, the main thing he tells them to do, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So right out of the gate, we see that God tells Adam and Eve, one of the primary purposes for marriage is procreation, to be fruitful and multiply. And by the way, throughout all of human history until about 10 minutes ago, uh, or we'll just say last century to actually be truthful, sex and babies were connected. Only recently has the concept of casual sex, family planning, or married people purposefully not having children been a thing. So with that, it's important to say the default position for Christians should be marriage and children. Default. There are exceptions, I understand. There are people who cannot bear children. There are people like Jesus and Paul who uh, have a, a singleness gift where God is increasing their ministry capacity uh, in that way. Uh, but, but guys, listen, those are exceptions. Those are not the rule. And I say that because many people in our culture get married to people that they think are fun and attractive, but they don't ever consider the fact that they're probably going to have babies with this person, and, and that's going to be the husband, uh, the, the father of those kids, or the mother of those kids. So ladies, listen, you got to think down the line here. When you choose a husband, you're also choosing a father for your kids. Men, when you choose a wife, you're choosing a mother for your kids. That's why this is a covenant. It's not casually broken because it's not just about you. The Bible presupposes married people will bear children and that this covenant is a protection to them as well. Later in Genesis 2, the story is told again in detail, and Eve is made from the side of Adam, and then the commentary says over the top, the narrator says in Genesis 2, 24, he says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So we've said what a marriage covenant does. It's a partnership to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. But now we see what it is. It's a union of two people and the creation of a new family unit. Here's another thing I like to tell people in premarital counseling. When you get married, you're not joining a new family. You're making a new family. While it is true, all the, all the in-laws just raised an eyebrow at me, hang on. While it is true, you do marry into your spouse's family, and that is serious enough to ask some good questions about it. While that is true, you do marry into their family. At the end of the day, you're not so much joining their family as you are making something new. You leave your father and mother behind, and you create a new family unit now that is to take precedence above what you left behind. You've left your father and mother's family. You are now one flesh with your spouse. Two become one in a way that I can only say is spiritual. You're a team. You, you exist for each other. You help each other grow. You are to be singularly minded with priorities that are on the same page. And so that's, that's what it does and that's what it is. Lastly, lastly, I want to show you what it pictures. Marriage itself is perhaps the strongest biblical metaphor for the gospel that we have. You see, you don't, you don't have the right to do marriage your way because it's intended to be a teaching device to teach very specific things. Ephesians 5.22 says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. So the metaphor is clear. Wives are to picture the church. Husbands are to picture Christ. Another goal we see from marriage in this text is actually similar to salvation. One of the goals of marriage is actually sanctification. You may have heard it said, the primary goal of marriage is not to be happy, it's to be holy. That's where this comes from. Marriage is to point us to the gospel. The very nature of it is designed to sanctify husband and wife, to make us more like Christ. Hey, guess what? 
you're not the same. Uh, if you have a man and a woman together, you're not the same. Things are hard. Men and women don't think alike. We don't act alike. Even if you married a spouse that has a lot in common with you, there's still challenges that you have to work through living together in that space over and over again with someone who is not like you at all. And you know what that is? It's sanctifying. It's sanctifying work to put someone else ahead of yourselves at all times, to sacrifice for someone else, to put your needs on the bottom shelf and to put someone else's needs on the top shelf. That is greatly sanctifying. And that's why Paul says what he does. That's why this is serious. It's holy. It's a consecrated covenant you enter into because of what it does. It makes a new people with souls. You have babies that have souls. It's very serious. Because of what it is, it unites two people into one flesh. And because of what it pictures, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This thing called marriage is not free to be made into what we want to make it to be. It's designed by God with a purpose. It's for your sanctification. So, if we want a lasting generational impact, we have to see marriage as God sees it. Number one, a consequential choice. Number two, a consecrated covenant. And number three, a continuing commitment. A continuing commitment. Now, here's what I mean by this. If our game is the long game, the hundred-year war, we have to think about our marriages in terms of a continual investment rather than a handful of big moments. The goal is to love your spouse, not only to love them, but to like them your whole life, to stay married, to stay faithful to one another, to have a life full of laughter and smiling and joy at holiday events and joy at shared meals together, to have a fruitful, uh, hang on to your hats, sex life, that goes beyond the first decade of your marriage to fulfill each other for your lives, to see each other not as the old battle axe, the old ball and chain, but to preserve that affection that you had on your wedding day throughout your life and to weather changing seasons together with one another. Remember what we just read in Ephesians 5. Paul commands husbands, love your wives, cherish her, Man, I'm speaking of myself too. That's not just for the wedding day. That's for every day. That's a lifelong commitment to love one another, to give everything to her, to put all of your energy and strength and sexuality and joy, the best of who you are, to invest it in one place, not to scatter your strength to the four winds for any and all. I'm going to read from Proverbs 5.15 now. You're welcome to turn there. Proverbs 5 and 7 are two of the strongest chapters in the Bible warning against adultery. And thus to give all your strength and all your efforts in your own marriage, to invest in your own home, to give your best to your spouse rather than fall for the trap of the adulteress. Fair warning, this is a, uh, one of the more sexual passages in the Bible, all right? I just don't want any, any shrieks when we get there, okay? Uh, but it is extremely relevant to what we're talking about. Proverbs 5, 15 and on. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? What's the message here? Don't go out in the streets to get what you should be getting at home. Don't give your resources to someone who seeks only to take from you. I love that phrase in verse 18. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Find your joy and strength in that girl you were infatuated with in your early 20s, the one you got excited about, the one you bought the ring for and you nervously proposed to, gentlemen, on the quivering bended knee, the one who took a chance on you before you were who you are today, the one who wore the white dress and walked the aisle for you. 
the one who went through childbirth for you and invest in your children. Give everything to her. Invest in her. Don't give her a portion of your love. You know, there, there are unique blessings in life that belong to those who do things God's ways. And you just simply miss out if you don't do it that way. It doesn't mean God can't work with our sin and make us new. He can. But I'm just telling you, there are certain things that when you do it God's ways, there's another level of blessings in your life that you can have. For example, the joy of a 50-year wedding anniversary. If you've pulled that off, what does that mean? It means likely you married your spouse when you were both young, that you are the husband or wife of their youth. It means that you've stayed committed to your marriage over a long period of time, that you know what it is to invest in one person for 50 years, and likely that you have children and grandchildren who will look up to you as an example of what godly marriage should be. In fact, I'm having some fun today. If you're here today and you have enjoyed a 50-year wedding anniversary with your spouse, whether you are a widow now or not, a widow or now, whether they've passed on, I want to know who you are. Would you stand up if you have had a 50-year wedding anniversary in your life? Amen. Amen. I hope, you, I hope you remember who these folks are, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a question about marriage, maybe don't go to Google first. Maybe go to one of these people and ask them, what an incredible legacy to leave behind for their kids and grandkids, a testimony about covenant-keeping faithful love. Church, listen, we have got to get back to that mentality because the truth is we are seeing less and less of that, not more and more of that. Divorce has become so common and casual, I'm afraid there's going to be a day in my preaching life where I can't even do that exercise anymore. We have to have a radical commitment to invest in our marriages. I know nobody likes to talk about divorce because it's so commonplace. And listen, that's exactly why we need to talk about it. When we talk about the hundred-year war, the, the oaks of righteousness that stand tall in 21, 23, it's important to say divorce will set you back in that endeavor. It's important to say it, it snaps a branch from the tree that God is building in your life. And listen, I understand, again, I, I need to say this, there are real things that happen like abuse and adultery and abandonment that are exceptions worth our consideration, but I'm talking about the mass majority of cases that are not those things. And yes, I know God can redeem any situation. There is life to be had after a divorce. You are not garbage after a divorce. He can grow a new branch out of a chopped off tree stump. I've seen it happen. God can do it. And, and we need to be recipients of his grace in all things. But we need also a sober reminder once in a while of the cost. These young families, we have young families in our church that are in their first and prayerfully only marriage. And they need to hear a challenge from me to fight for their marriages and to build toward that 50-year anniversary. I came across a text this week in Malachi 2. It's a lesser-known text. It really hit me hard, probably because I... I don't read Malachi that often, but it's about a time in Israel after the captivity. So they're back. They're back in their land. They've rebuilt the temple. The priests are back functioning. They're, they're, the band is back together, and they're, and they're rolling. They're rocking and rolling. But basically, God says, listen, I'm, I'm not interested in your sacrifices right now. I'm, I'm not giving you my blessings right now because you're out of control. You have far too many divorces let me read Malachi 2.13 as God tells Malachi why he's not happy with Israel. He says, he says, the second thing you do, this is a judgment text from God. He says, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. And you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, 
Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. God is quite straightforward here. He talks to his people and says, look, I'm not blessing you right now because there's so much divorce among you. Why would we expect God to bless a church or a nation that has made a regular practice of breaking covenants with him? Ladies and gentlemen, listen, young families, do not take that bait. Don't buy the lie of the world that you owe it to yourself to be happy, that your kids will be better off when you're happy and divorced, or that slogan from Ashley Madison, life is short, have an affair. Do not buy it. They are lies. Satan may be evil, but he's not stupid. He knows that if he can attack the trunk of the tree, he gets the whole branch. He hits the root and he gets the fruit. So invest in your marriage, church. Fight for them. The grass is not always greener on the other side. Sometimes you just need to water the grass you're standing on. This is how you get the oak of righteousness. This is how we position ourselves for 21-23 victory. Long, fruitful, joyous marriages with the wife of our youth. Like I said, you may have already crossed that line. It doesn't mean God is done with you. You might have to plant your flag in the ground today and say, what's done is done. The milk is spilled. The cat's out of the bag. But I can walk forward with the Lord today. I can't undo the past, but I can walk forward with the Spirit of God today and tomorrow. That may need to be what you do. And I can tell my children not to make the same mistakes that I made. Maybe that's why God taught you that lesson. But this is the path forward. Before we talk about raising godly children, which we're going to do in the coming weeks, before we talk about being a great mom, a great dad, protecting our kids from the world, before we go there, we need to get marriage right. We need to get marriage right. It is the root before the fruit. Your marriage sets the tone for your children's lives and honestly, for their future marriages. They will either consciously or subconsciously repeat what they've seen in you. I am shocked every day in myself of how much I am my mom and dad on autopilot. I'm shocked. And, and, And all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Those moments in life where you're like, what do I do in this situation? And you don't know. You think, well, what did my parents do? And that's where you go. So parents, you are that for someone else. So we have to take this seriously. It is a consequential choice. It is a consecrated covenant, and it requires a continuing commitment. When you want a fruit tree to grow, you don't water the fruit at the end of the branches. You don't pour water on flowers to make the tree grow. No, you pour water on the roots, and the rest of the tree will grow. Your marriage is the root. Water it, and by God's grace, you will see the fruit. Let's pray together.